Well, greetings once again, Doug. It is uh, good to be with you. I am unfortunately not able to see you right now, but I'm hoping that you have maintained our tradition uh, so far um, <laughs> with, a, yes. with a sweater. And it looks like we both got the same memo. <laughs> <laughs> well, I I decided to dump the Kuji today. Just uh, I don't know. I, I just I just sort of felt like know. it would it would it would. Uh, Rich is Rich is clapping in the other room, but I I just thought it would make us more on the same page because I'm not sure we're on the same page on this particular topic, and that's, that's what we're right. discussing. So that's uh, right. That, that would be good. So I caught a uh, video of yours, one of the Ask Doug uh, videos. And it sort of brought up the issues that we've discussed uh, in in partial format in a previous debate, anyways. Yeah. And uh, you were asked a question about uh, Tolkien and Chesterton, and your right. immediate response to the question that you were asked because you're asked, were they Christians? And your your response right. was, if they weren't, then I'm in deep trouble. Right. Um. So would you like to uh, play, put that into a, a particular context, want to uh, fulfill that in some way, and then I can push back on that? Or would you like me to provide my objection first? Well, why don't, I don't want to rob you of the pleasure of registering your objection. So why, <laughs> so why don't you start with that? Oh, you're not going to rob me of it one way or the other, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, okay. But yeah, let's, uh, this, is, this is why it caught my attention. Um, your uh, your discussion, I agreed with many of the things that you said. For example, we are not saved by doctrinal perfectionism. Um, I think uh, a, a young I was I was saved as a young child without a clear understanding of the distinction between the imputation of Christ's righteousness or the infusion of Christ's righteousness. Right. Um, I I get all of those things, though I would point out, especially. I'm primarily focused upon Chesterton. I, I am unaware of Tolkien having said anything about Reformed theology. I don't know the depth of his theological knowledge of Roman Catholic dogma and yeah. things like that. My yeah, assumption right. is that Chesterton was a full-throated, fully knowledgeable follower of the dogmas of the Roman Catholic Church. Um, I, if, if I'm wrong about that, but it, it does seem from his now, he was all He was all in. You're correct. Okay, he yeah. was all in. I would quarrel with the phrase fully knowledgeable because when he, when he attacks Calvinism, which Chesterton does frequently, yes. you know, he'll, he'll backhand Calvinism, um, he, he really does... So in a Chestertonian way, which is exasperating. In other words, oh, yeah. he doesn't he doesn't know what he's talking about. Except I, uh, when I said fully knowledgeable, I said of Rome's dogmas. Not not so, I, I would agree that there's a, a tremendous. Uh, you could have lit up all of his cigars with the straw men that he that he lit up <laughs> as far as 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 it goes with Calvinism. But um, in other words, the the point is that we're not talking about a five year old as far as their knowledge of dogma. He knows right. what he believes. That's that. That's right. the issue, and Correct. and I agree with you that we are not saved by works. We are not saved by doctrinal perfectionism, but we are saved by the gospel, and that to me is the real key issue. Is I would like to be hopeful that in some fashion, um, what we read in Chesterton in regards to his dedication to Roman Catholic theology um, did not actually reflect where he really was. But the real question that was raised by uh, the, the video that, that you did right. was, can the Roman Catholic gospel save? Not can work save, um, not uh, do you have to get everything right? But if my heart is truly dedicated to the propositions that I'll, I'll admit, I don't, I don't think Francis, the Pope today, is actually committed to the key Roman Catholic dogmas that define the papacy for, for literally centuries. I don't, right. I just don't I think, I don't think, think he is. Um, right. 
So, but that we're talking Chesterton's time and mm -hmm. in his context, um, if he truly, truly was dedicated to all the propositions regarding a denial of the imputation of the righteousness of Christ, a denial of the finished work of Christ in the sense that you have within Roman Catholicism the concept of the Mass as a propitiatory sacrifice. Right. If he was coming to the Mass, and I'm assuming that he uh, uh, partook regularly, not just the minimum times that Rome said, but I would assume that he would see that as a absolutely necessary sacramental mechanism of bringing about his own salvation. If, right. if he's going to the mass and believing that this is an unbloody representation of the one sacrifice of the cross that will never perfect him, that he could die and go to purgatory. He could commit a mortal sin and lose and, and, and become the enemy of God, even though he approached the cross 10,000 times in his life. Right. The question is, is that a salvific uh, faith? No. So if, if someone approaches their, their prayers to Mary, if someone approaches the mechanism of the Roman Catholic Church, and that is where their trust is, that is where their heart is, that's what they're relying on, that is a, a reed that's going to break. That gospel cannot save. Mm -hmm. Okay? So uh, I forget if I said this in that video, but the reason I... The reason I uh, can accept people like Chesterton and Tolkien as people who who had the spiritual lights on, right? You know, the the I I recognize or I I um, feel like I'm interacting with a brother or being taught by a brother um, when I'm dealing with them. The only reason I can do that as a convinced and uh, convinced and confessional Protestant is that I can recognize them as brothers precisely because they're wrong, right? If, if we're saved by works, then they're in trouble because they're praying to pictures, man. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, um, that's, uh, that's damnable. If, so if, if you are uh, praying to pictures, that's a sin. If your trust, if your uh, the reformers broke um, faith into uh, uh, notitia, Ascensus and fiducia. Right. Um, the um, we're talking about the fiducia compo component here. If their trust is in this gospel as it's uh, articulated by Trent, and they say that's right, that's correct, and that's where my faith is, that's where my fiducia is, then I believe that such a person is lost um, because you you can't be saved unless you're trusting in Jesus, period. Uh, so it's solus, salvation is solus Christus, uh, right. Christ alone. Now, and this is a place where we, I think we're going to agree on a lot of this, but the, a place where we might disagree is I, th I think that many people are far better Christians than they are logicians. The, the, they will, so if you pressed Chesterton, if I said to Chesterton, do you accept the teachings of the Council of Trent? He would say, absolutely, yes. Mm -hmm. you, you know, uh, do you believe in the in the teaching office of the church, the magisterium of the church? He'd say, absolutely, yes. Do you think it's appropriate to pray to Mary? Absolutely, yes. You know, you know all of these things. Um, but and so consequently, if I accept him as someone who is truly converted. Um, and incidentally, Chesterton was converted to Christianity initially as an Anglican. So when when he flipped from um, when he flipped from his unbelief to Christianity, when he wrote the book Orthodoxy, he he wrote that book as someone who was friendly to Rome, but wasn't he wasn't yet a uh, Roman Catholic there. So when he was converted, I think that's only possible if you're trusting in um, in Christ alone. That's that's got to be where your faith is, because faith is the sole instrument of justification, etc. Now, the the thing that um, the thing that uh, people trip over, I think, is oftentimes um, some of the Roman Catholic um, 
intellectuals who that I respect in the um, current culture wars, Robert George, um, Tony Esselin, people like that. Um, and they're on the other side of the Protestant Catholic divide from me. Uh, the, the, the irony is the more educated and intelligent a person is, the more likely it is that they've got intellectual workarounds, a little pathway for the ascensus to get to Christ alone, while, the, while intellectually affirming all, this, all the things, all the stuff. Where you run into trouble is where you're dealing with some Mexican peasant woman who's uneducated and who's just, whose, whole, whose whole fiducia life is wrapped up in the votive candles and the pictures and the, the you know, it's just sheer idolatry. That's, um, there's, and there's no workarounds. There's, there's no intellectual sophistication. There's no Jesuitical um, way of saying, well, I trust in Jesus, but I, I also do these other things. Those things I regard as sinful, but not as damnable if the person is really trusting in Jesus. So, okay, now see, when, when people have asked me, as they have many, many times because of how many debates I've done with Roman Catholic apologists down through the years, they, they ask me, so you're saying that just simply because a person's Roman Catholic, they can't possibly be saved. And my answer is always no. Um, I believe that there are people within the Roman communion um, who have a simple faith in Jesus. But mm -hmm. my understanding has always been, and that's probably due to inconsistency on their part. You just said most people are not logicians. Right. Um, but Chesterton was. Uh, so when he Chesterton was when he felt like it. Well, OK. Yeah. Uh, and, and all of us are are when we feel like it. I mean, we all suspend that at one point or another. But I've always had the I've always taken the position that it is more likely that it's the peasant lady who has a simple faith that Jesus will save her and does the rest of this stuff because that's what everybody does, who is likely to be the recipient of salvation, than mm -hmm. it is the intellectual who is fully aware of what the Roman gospel is and what it says specifically about the death of Christ. Mm -hmm. And the, pro, the, 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 the priest is an altar Christus and, and all the rest of this stuff, but especially the, the uh, denunciation of the idea, which Luther uh, sort of illustrated, well, if it was even Luther that did it, we're not 100% certain, but the, the dunghill analogy right. is, is really a good analogy in not only saying what we're, what we're saying about the relationship of sanctification and justification, they're absolutely connected with one another, but they must be distinguished from one another. But the Roman Catholic response to that is that by baptism, you're turned into a pile of gold. You're infused with, 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 with righteousness. And then as you sin, you get flecks of dung on the surface. And if you commit a mortal sin, you turn back into a pile of dung, but you don't know. You have no way of knowing in this life whether you're a pile of dung or a pile of gold. That really illustrates where some of these issues are. It takes me back to Galatians, and it takes me back to asking the question, um, who is a pseudodelphoi? Who is one of the false brethren? And what allowed an apostle to lay that out for us in Galatians 1 and 2? And so are you saying that you have a greater hope for... Um, are you saying you have a hope for Chesterton? Or are you saying you have a real confidence? In I, I would say, obviously, uh, the the Lord is in charge of the last judgment, the final judgment. He's not entrusted that to us. Right. So we would um, we would always be speaking in terms of um, the judgment of charity and hopefulness and so forth. But the thing that I encounter when I read when I read Chesterton, which I do a lot, is I don't just encounter worldly wisdom. I, you know, I can read books by educated non-Christians and learn things about, you know, by common grace, they point something out here and something out there and something about the, you know. But when I read Chesterton, I frequently can't go three pages 
without running into astounding spiritual insight. The, the lights are on. In, in other words, it's not just earthly wisdom. It's not just rotate your tires or change your oil every 3,000 miles. It's, um, it's uh, spiritual wisdom that that smells like Jesus. It's just a, it's the sort, you know, it's, it's like um, the kind of thing that you could say, oh, that's, that's glorious. That's glorious. And that's glorious. Now, I, what I'm trying to do is account for that, that level of spiritual insight and that level of me being say, able to say, yeah, that's in the Bible. I can't believe I didn't see that before. Or the, you know, he, he teaches and instructs me on things that this is a, let me hit the pause button a minute. The mark of, a, I think, a, a, a true Bible teacher is someone who is able to point things out to you in the text that you never saw before, and as soon as he points it out, you can't stop seeing it. You know, it's, there, it's there in the text. The authority, of, the authority of the Word comes not from Chesterton or not from Augustine or not from his. It's the fact that it's grounded in the Word. So when I read Chesterton, I run into astounding levels of spiritual light, spiritual insight. And, and this is coming from a Roman Catholic, and I'm a convinced confessional Protestant. How do I account for that? Well, so I have, I would say, answering your question, I have a high level of confidence, as I indicated in that little video, I have a high level of confidence that Chesterton was a true brother, truly converted, and that's why he is a repository of biblical wisdom. And I'm grateful that he's wrong on justification by, you know, in the Roman Catholic system, because there are these other parts of his life that would be, if we're saved by works, it w- would be damnable works. And in, in other words, the, his ad- adherence to certain errors, his willingness to affirm them, and defend them, and defend them in a chivalric, you know, flamboyant way. Uh, well, I'd say that's not that's not cool, man. You're, you're that's I'm grateful that you're wrong on that because you being wrong on that is why I can think that you're saved. Okay, so when when Paul let, let's go ahead and if we could in the second chapter of Galatians, Paul talks about uh, the the Suda del Foy, the, the false, false brothers. brothers. Um, who were secretly brought in to, to spy out the liberty which you have in, in Christ Jesus in order to bring us into bondage. Right. And he says we didn't yield them subjection for one minute. So the truth of the gospel might remain with you. So here's, here's the question. Are you saying that Chesterton had the truth of the gospel? Was it because he was a convert from where he might have heard the truth of the gospel beforehand? Is, I think he had the truth of the gospel in his life. I don't think he, there were times when he's, whenever he's talking about Rome, I don't think he had it in his mouth, but I think he had it in his life. Okay. Um, so let, let me put, let me uh, pursue the Galatians il- illustration. Right. So you've got the, uh, you've got the false brothers. You've got the, um, that Paul says they're the, of the party of the circumcision. Uh, I'll give you two examples. Uh, at the end of Romans, I think it is, where um, Paul is going through a list of names, and he, ta- he mentions one person who is of the circumcision who is, who is helpful to me, right? And so I'm, I'm taking that as there's, there's a divide in the early church. There's the, the Judaizers who were false. You know, they didn't give in to them for a minute, right. uh, the, the Judaizers. So then the question is, uh, were there any truly converted people among the Judaizers? Okay, so I take um, I take John Mark, who wrote the Gospel of Mark, as being a, a, a proto Judaizer. Um, when John Mark accompanies them on the first missionary journey, uh, John Mark leaves them in Pamphylia, which is the first stop after the first cold call on a. Uh, on Sergius Paulus, on the first cold call conversion of a Gentile who was not a God-fearer in the back of the synagogue. Mm-hmm. He, was just, he was just a regular Gentile. And John Mark leaves uh, right after that in Pamphylia. Then the, there's the, I take Galatians, the Galatian controversy as 
being right prior to the Jerusalem Council. And there's this flare up in Galatia and the Jerusalem Council meets in Acts 15 and they settle the question. A Gentile, the Judaizers are wrong, basically. The, the Judaizers are wrong and uh, Gentiles don't have to be circumcised in order to become Christians. Right. Then right after that, Barnabas wants to take John Mark with them on the next missionary journey. Paul says nothing doing, right? Uh, Barnabas is a relative of John Mark. John Mark has apparently accepted the decision of the council, but is w- his background was that of a Judaizer. He was in the Judaizing party, I think. But I think he was clearly, truly converted. Right? He, he's a converted man, but he was on the wrong side of that issue. So some of the brothers who, um, who represented themselves as men from James, well, J- James was converted, but the men from James were false brothers. So it's, it's a church controversy, and you've got people, good guys and bad guys, on, on both sides. So there are people who were on Paul's side— let's say Demas, you know, who, who were on Paul's side, who were not truly converted, and people on the bad guy's side, some of them who were. So Abner is uh, on Ishbosheth's side, and Joab is on David's. Right. You've got, things are, uh, things are sometimes complex. Mm-hmm. So I think that the Roman Catholic system as a system is an ungodly, unbiblical system. I believe that the Roman Catholic doctrine of salvation is... Um, uh, uh, an unreliable gospel. It's not the true gospel. It, it, if you understand it and that's where your trust is, you're going to be disappointed. You're still lost. But can people over there uh, be muddled about all the ins and outs of it and have their intellectual assent be given to the Roman Catholic system? They memorized their catechism. You know, they They've got the Roman Catholic catechism down, but their assent, their their fiducia, their their fidu, their trust, not their assent, their trust is in Christ alone. But you you know that Chesterton would have probably been offended at the very suggestion of that. Oh, absolutely offended, and that's why it delights me to say it because <laughs> because because Chesterton um, Chesterton offends me frequently, and he's one of those rare writers who can edify me in the middle of offending me. So he can be going on about Calvinism and talk and talking nonsense about Calvinism while and and I I'm, I'm saying oh, that's that's idiotic. You're you don't know what you're talking about. And at the same time I'm edified. Okay, let, let, let me see if we can flesh this out some though because when you when you say you, you see spiritual light right. that, you're 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 known for being fairly uh blunt and straightforward about certain things right but that seems squishy to me um because i recently uh i recently did a little test on facebook um we didn't end up discussing it very much but um i did a little test on facebook after the uh super bowl uh stuff a few weeks ago right um i posted comments about the halftime show that pretty much everybody who follows me on Facebook knows where I'm coming from um, would have gone, oh yeah, sure. And I said, I'm I'm not going to tell you who said this. Please guess. By the way, you won the guess poll by about 75 to 80, about 75 to 80% of my, of my followers on Facebook said, oh, that's, that's, that's Doug Wilson. And my immediate response was, are you kidding? There are not nearly enough words in this that you have to look up in a dictionary for that to be Doug Wilson. So there's <laughs> yeah, no right, way. Right. I mean, uh, thank you for ole- oleanerous. What was uh, it? Oh, oleaginous. 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 Yes. That, that's, oily. That means I mean, oily or buttery. I, I, believe me, I, I, I actually could figure it out just from the formation of it, but I'm just sort of like, do you play words with friends 23 hours out of the day? What do you do? I no, mean, I, I read dictionaries. I, I, so I, I, I get that feeling. And, uh, well, all you'd have to do is just read a page a day. It's just one little page and highlight any fun words that you come up with <laughs> and and then collect them. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I understand. I, I, 
We 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 understand. I'm in I'm in therapy over it. <laughs> well, you need to be. <laughs> you definitely need to be. So what I did, it, most people thought it was you. So in other words, it was it was spot on. It was insightful. It it recognized what's going on in our culture and 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 everything else. And then I said, I'll tell you who it is in a couple of days. And I forgot to do it initially. And eventually, I got around to it. And the quotation was from. Dr. Sheikh Yasser Qadi, who is a Muslim friend of mine, the one that I had the dialogues with a couple of years ago and just got uh, attacked right, left, and center. As two years the ago. One, so, yeah, the, one, the one that got you in all that trouble. Uh, well, I, oh. and not really. I, 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 I'm not blaming him, but the point is um, he is well read. He is, uh, you know, multiple languages, reads outside of, of his own narrow tradition. Et cetera, et cetera, and said things that I think we would probably use the term by common grace um, were obvious about the situation that we're, that, yeah. we're, that we're talking about. And so I can read these individuals and I have, um, as a younger person, as I was interacting with atheists, I was forced to see things in the Bible by atheists that my background had not caused yeah. me to necessarily see. So I see those things and I, I I can be benefited by people that on no basis whatsoever would I believe that this person is regenerate but oh, they sure. I, but they I know have, exactly yeah that they have the gift of, of of being made in the image of God I, I know exactly what you're talking about and I have that experience too where I get earthly wisdom from non-christian writers I, I read non-christian books regularly um, and I, I learn things from them. I don't do it just to punish myself. I, oh, I learn course. things from them. And I oftentimes learn things that are valuable from them. And that's not what I mean by spiritual light. Right. Uh, when, I, when, I'm, when I'm reading Chesterton, um, I, when I got out of the Navy, I came uh, to the University of Idaho and was studying uh, philosophy. I was a philo- excuse me, a philosophy major. I explained a lot of things right there. The, 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 yes. I've, I've uh, told people, people would ask me, what are you going to do with a philosophy degree? And I'd say, I'm going to get a job at taco time. <laughs> um, you lo- you, wait, be- wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> you love, you, do you like taco time? Yeah. Well, no, I'd say I'm going to get a job at taco. No, time. no, no, no. <laughs> I love taco time. <laughs> well, I would, I would said I was going to be the one in the back saying, what is a taco? Wait, wait a minute. Do you wait, have taco wait. time in Moscow? Oh yeah, yeah. Oh yes, <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> All right, crisp real, meat burrito. Crisp the, meat burritos, man. I'm not sure what the meat is, but crisp meat burrito. Right. I'm. <laughs> yeah, if, if you want to make me happy when I come up next month, okay, crisp this, meat burritos. Yeah, yeah, those are those are pretty good. But yeah. but the real question is, what is a taco, right? <laughs> <laughs> when you come right down to it, how do you define a taco? So yeah. I, I was taking philosophy courses, which is uh, mind mind deadening, soul deadening stuff. Oh yeah. But there's also there's good stuff in there, but it's just. And I encountered Chesterton for the first time my my first year studying philosophy, and Chesterton was a lifeline uh, to me spiritually. It was bracing common sense, bracing sanctified common sense. On fire, and uh, so Christianity. Uh, Chesterton says Christianity has died uh, many times. Uh, Christianity is you can write Christianity off; it's died many times. But that's all right because we worship a God who knows the way out of the grave, right? So that that sort of thing is food for me, food for the soul. It, it there's there's something to chew on there. It's the kind of insight that I wouldn't expect the wisest non-Christian to ever have. And I just see that sort of thing regularly in Chesterton. And so I, I regard him as a mass of contradictions. You know, I think that he is— um, the, uh, C.S. Lewis once said that if he, if he could— um, he, C.S. Lewis was talking about the Puritans in—this is in um, a collection of books, a uh, collection of essays called Selected Literary Essays— and in one of those essays, Lewis says, if I can take the name of a great writer, a great human being, and a great Roman Catholic, he says, the Puritans were much more Chestertonian than their adversaries. <laughs> All right. So he, Lewis, looking, looking uh, through church history, 
wanted to find what group of people were, were the most Chestertonian in their exuberance and their love for life and their in their uh, you know and Lewis settled on the Puritans and and of course that would have exasperated Chesterton himself no end but Lewis saw, Lewis saw the same thing that I'm seeing that that Chesterton had a way of looking at the world um, sideways in in a way that it illuminated it illuminates it spiritually and so then I have to account okay how do I fit this in to Protestant theology. I could, I think I could fit Chesterton into my formal theology far better than Chesterton could fit someone like me into his, right? Uh, you're assuming that he would see the similar kind of light in you? Well, yeah, but he would have no way of processing it. So, in, in other words, if, if you take, um, l- let's take a um, uh, an approach to Catholicism that makes conservative, confessional Protestants like me nervous, and that would be C.S. Lewis's approach in Mere Christianity, where he, he he's laying out Mere Christianity, and he says uh, early on that the Christian house has many rooms, and it's in the rooms where you take your meals and 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 live. And I'm just trying to get people into the hallway, in in through the front door and into right. the hallway. Um, and then, and then pick your room, right? P- you might wind up a Wesleyan Methodist. You might wind up a Presbyterian. You might wind up a Roman Catholic. So Lewis has this mansion of Christendom image right. at the at the beginning, and he just wants to get people through the front door of mere Christianity. Okay, that phrase is taken from Baxter, Richard Baxter, a uh, a Puritan writer, and there's a touchstone is a, a magazine, a journal of mere Christianity, and they have EO writers and Roman Catholic writers and Protestant writers, and you know, good they have good articles and stuff. It's a journal of mere Christ, uh, mere Christianity. What a lot of people don't recognize is that the mere Christian concept, with the different rooms, right, is uh, is a Protestant construct. It's not a Roman Catholic construct. No, the, well, the, it couldn't be. Couldn't, yeah, be. couldn't be. Right? So, well, um, well, with Francis, all bets are off. But yeah. yes, historically. Well, so um, J. Gresham Machen, in the, at the beginning of Christianity and Liberalism, J. Gresham Machen says some friendly things about Roman Catholicism uh, over against liberalism. He mm-hmm. says, basically, he, he's arguing that Roman Catholicism is a deficient form of Christianity. Liberalism is another religion altogether. Uh, liberalism is another faith. And I agreed with your earlier comments. I think Francis is a representative of that other faith. I oh, think yeah. I, I don't think Francis is a uh, traditional Roman Catholic at all. No. Um, and so he, he would be far more ecumenical. He'd want, want to be ecumenical in the religion of man sense, uh, yeah. right? The mere Christian concept is a distinctively Protestant construct now, you might be a Protestant that is in error about whether this particular sect gets a room or whether they're living in the woods out back. You know, are they, are they outside the mansion altogether? Mm-hmm. But the idea of, of this large thing called Christianity, of which Roman Catholicism only has a room, contradicts yes. Roman, Roman Catholic theology. They, yes. they would say, sorry, brother, uh, we're the whole house. You know this. This is the whole house, and and so. Well, Chester- they, they let they, they let the Eastern Orthodox have the basement, but it's a <laughs> it's a strange relationship, right? Yeah. And so then a confessional Protestant, someone like Chesterton, who was feeling um, uh, kind of friendly one day and wanted to in court, you know fit us in, um, the they have to turn themselves inside out to uh, uh, identifying us as separated brethren and mm-hmm. you know different things, but. What, are we living on the lawn? What are we? What are we? Right. What are we doing? So I, I have a place. I have a place for the Chestertons, and it doesn't go the other way because no. I, I believe that Protestantism is more expansive um, by definition, and the and the central errors of Pro, the central errors of Rome are uh, the the semi Pelagianism, for example, the the false views of justification and so forth, 
those errors are shared by multitudes of Protestant denominations. Oh, most, most definitely. Right. Sadly. Um, so, yeah, no question about that. But here's here's what I'd want to I'd want to focus in on. And certainly you have fleshed out your response much more fully here right. than you had the opportunity. It was only an eight minute video, as I recall. So um, at the very least, hopefully that's been worth your time this morning. Yeah, yeah absolutely. The, don absolutely. the, don the yeah. donning of a sweater vest. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, and my discovery my, my joyous discovery that you have taco time in Moscow. I, I, it's just, <laughs> yes. I am now truly excited about next month. I, I really am. Um, <laughs> well, and when I go there, when I go there, it, I get a crispy meat burrito. Yeah. yeah. That, that's uh, I, I, I won't waste our time telling you about my history in Utah with, with taco time, but it's just associated with me with reaching out to Mormons and has been for decades. And we just don't have them in Arizona. So uh, that's, that's, Probably good for my waistline, but <laughs> other than that, it's it's a sort of sad thing. So I'm looking forward to that. But let's let me let me focus in upon this. All right, you all of a sudden have the opportunity of sitting down with Chesterton before right. death. Okay, right. um, so he doesn't he doesn't know what he knows now. Uh, this is this is in the past somehow. We've so I'm not I'm not trying that. to get him out of purgatory. You're not uh, trying to get <laughs> out of whatever that thing is. Um, there's no sadus pasio here. So. Um, what are you going to talk to him about? In other words, for Doug Wilson, is it if if you're saying I see spiritual light, do you therefore, as a result, go? So I'm just not going to talk about the imputed righteousness thing. I'm going to talk about other things we might share in common or something like that. Or do you feel that there is a uh, a real necessity to seek to bring correction on the very central aspect of how, because see, I don't know how Chesterton believing what he said he believed right. could then have the peace he professes to have. Right. Because Rome doesn't provide that foundation of peace. If, if, if before you put your head on the pillow tonight, you can commit a mortal sin that is going to turn you into the enemy of God. Um, and then you have to go through all this stuff to try to get back to that point. That's not what Irene means. That's not what Shalom means. Right. I don't see how Rome's gospel can truly give peace. Yet what you're saying is, I see that he had this peace. Therefore, what are you going to talk to him about? What are you going to say to him? I'm. What I would talk to him about is that would be the topic of conversation. And what I would talk to him about is you clearly, self-evidently to me, have this peace and this joy. You're exhibiting to me the fruit of the Spirit. What exasperates me about you is that you have no way of giving an accounting for it, right? You, you, have, um, you have this thing and you deny with your mouth the, the Protestant doctrine of assurance of salvation, right? Um, you would criticize the Calvinist assurance and the, the, the hard-bitten uh, Tishbite Calvinist who has assurance and he's sour and dour. And you're jolly and happy and overflowing with uh, the joy of living. But how can, that, how can you give a, a, an account of that joy? You're living like a Protestant ought to, given the Protestant doctrines. Mm -hmm. And you're living, you're a walking, living, breathing contradiction of what you profess to believe doctrinally as a Roman Catholic, you ought to be, you ought to be uh, proceeding far more carefully <laughs> than you are. Um, you're a swashbuckler. You you act, and so I think when Lewis said uh, the Puritans were Chestertonian, he really was. There was something um, liberated about the Puritans, and it was the gospel liberation. Mm -hmm. And I would say uh, to Chesterton, you. Don't, I want. I would like to see you lay an out, lay out an argument that shows how your fruit, your embrace of the of God's world, can be built on the foundation that you you tell me it's built on. I and that's what we would we would talk about. I'm not I'm not going to deny what I see as your lived experience. I've profited too much from you. I'm not going to deny that. I just want to I just want to see what this thing is resting on. Where do you end up drawing the line then? Um, 
there are obviously all sorts of Roman Catholics today who are seeking to maintain some type of fidelity to historical Roman Catholic belief, especially in the area of soteriology in the face of uh, Francis. Right. I mean, that's just, uh, you could, that's the only way you can describe it is he is a crisis for Roman Catholicism. There are many uh, bishops uh, and others who are describing him as a complete crisis for the church. And right. as far as I can see, for as long as, certainly as long as you and I are going to be alive and, and probably our children as well, Francis will always be someone we can point back to when Roman Catholicism starts touting the Pope as the central epistemological foundation of its, of its system and go, really? Uh, remember him? Right. <laughs> you know, the guy that's not sure what to do about homosexuality and things like that. Um, so he is a crisis for the church. And so, but there are still Roman Catholics who are well aware of what was intended by Trent, what was intended uh, by Vatican I, uh, what was intended even when the, the bodily assumption of Mary was defined, mm -hmm. um, who are trying to maintain that kind of old style, bristly um, Roman Catholicism that, that the indulgence laden form. Right. Um, what do you, would you agree with me that these are individuals who are just as I see the ultra liberal union theological graduate right. as a necessary uh, audience of evangelism? Right. They need to hear the gospel. Right. Everyone needs to hear the gospel. I, I get that. We don't need to go down that road. There are people that are in good, solid churches that really need to hear the gospel in a way they've never heard it before. I get all that. But would you see those Roman Catholics who are trying to hold firm in the midst of the, the Franc Franciscan storm? I would think that Chesterton would have been one of them. Yeah, absolutely. So you would see them as necessary, urgent a necessary, urgent audience of gospel proclamation of what we would call evangelism. Yes. So if I'm if I'm um, interacting with an individual next door neighbor or someone I'm acquainted with in town, um, and I have to decide if, if I've got an ongoing relationship with them, is this fellowship and friendship in Christ, or is mm -hmm. this evangelism? Right. Okay. And taking one thing with another, if I had, if I'm dealing with uh, uh, Tridentine uh, Roman Catholics, they're holding the line, and I'm rooting for them as as they're fighting Francis and the. Uh, <laughs> I'm I'm. Isn't that an odd thing to be rooting for, though? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. It, it basically, um, Jake Resimachin one time said to BB Warfield that he was worried about a church split in the Presbyterian church. This is before everything came down. Before the split happened. Be before yeah. the split happened. He right. was worried about a, a, a split in the mainline Presbyterian denomination. And Warfield said, uh, you can't split rotten wood. Okay. Uh, okay. Ro rotten wood won't split. And I think the Roman Catholic Church is going to fragment. I, th I don't think that they can survive Francis and Francis's light, likely successors. Mm. Now, um, I, I believe that if the uh, ultramontane Roman Catholics, if the uh, die, you know, the the true blue, the people who believe that Jesus was divine, the people who still believe in the Trinity, the, the, they still believe in objective truth, they still believe in, you know, I'm rooting for those guys over against the the postmodern mush that right. is is happening in the church at large. Not because I think they're correct, but because I think that you can argue with them. You can, right, exactly. You, you know, there's, there yes. is, um, we have a shared commitment to objective truth. Yes. And so I would, I'd want them to win so that I could preach the gospel to them. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> Not, yeah, the other, the, the other folks is like, it, it's, it's next to impossible to even begin to communicate because there's no, there's no common ground. Right, right. So you've got this vat of goo on the one hand. Um, as opposed to, and this is a, incidentally his, uh, another historical example of this, is the difference between Roman Catholics and Eastern Orthodox. It's very difficult to debate or argue with an Eastern Orthodox oh, yes. person. Oh yes. yes. Um, and with the in the in the Roman Catholic tradition, Protestants and and Roman Catholics can actually have a real debate because yep. they're both Western. 
right. The, the, right. You know, they, right. they 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 both have a common shared inheritance. And yeah, I'm not sure if you, I'm not sure if Doug, if you saw this, but uh, less than two years ago, I did a debate at a Gafcon Anglican Church okay. in Belfast. Okay. Uh, with uh, I think you'd really enjoy getting to know Peter Williams. Okay. Um, he is a, a really sharp, very nice Roman Catholic fellow. And believe it or not, he was willing to go to Belfast and debate me publicly on okay. indulgences. Okay. Now, all right. You, you don't. You're not going to find too many people today that are that are willing to do defending that. defending the but, indulgence. Yeah. Yeah. You know. I mean, um, but there is an illustration of exactly what we're what we're talking about. There's someone who, who, very very intelligent, willing to stand up. We were willing to do this. I, I mean, can you imagine? that happening in the 1970s or 80s in Belfast? Yeah. No, 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 not, not, not going to happen. It is good that that type of a thing is, is taking place. But there you have an example, and there's an, there's an issue where we can debate because he really does believe that indulgences are a God-ordained mechanism of salvific grace and so Yeah, on he, so forth. he thinks they're a thing. Yeah. They really are a thing rather than just, yeah, you know, we've done that in the past. You can take it. You can leave it. Yeah, you can't you can't deal with you you cannot even begin to engage those those types of folks because there's there's no communication going on because they really aren't committed to a a system that you can contrast truth with. Right. So let's say we win the debate against the postmodern liberalism and the subjectivism and all that rot um and we successfully fight our way back to the 1600s. <laughs> right. Right. All <laughs> the, all the all those issues in the Reformed confessions over against Trent, are still there. Yes. Right? Those, are, those have not yet been resolved. And when, some, when you have a group of people who are committed to that doctrinal system, then my operating assumption is preach the gospel, preach the liberty that's in Christ, while fully recognizing that some individuals on the other side might already be there, might already be experiencing what I'm talking about, and some people on my side might not be. But they are, you would at least say, we're talking about exceptions here, not the norm. Well, yes, uh, and not only would I say that, but the, a person who embraces uh, and signs every jot and tittle of the Westminster Confession— they they have have translated the Westminster Confession out of the original Greek, right? They've. <laughs> they, they, uh, I thought it was German, personally, but that's all right. Whatever. So so they've they're all on board with the Westminster Confession. Such a person can be lost, but the person who is lost while subscribing to every detail of the Westminster Confession is lost in spite of. Right. What he is saying, in spite of his doctrinal right. confession, right. Um, a Roman Catholic who is saved is saved in spite, in spite of, of, not Which because, not not because of, but in spite of. But it happens. Right. Yeah, that's that's always been the terminology that I've used, as offensive as it is to many of my Roman Catholic friends. Um, if a person actually in the commun communion of Rome is saved, it is in spite of the church, not because of the church. And and see my my concern is in listening in in hearing the the video. You and I both know we live in a day where the vast majority of our fellow believers within the broad spectrum of what's called evangelicalism don't know what the issues of the Reformation were. They they don't realize that the the primary issue there was not the necessity of grace. Rome says grace is necessary. It was the sufficiency of grace. Right. They don't understand the epistemological ramifications of sola scriptura over against the, the claims of Roman Catholicism or Eastern Orthodoxy's denial of sola scriptura as well, right. which is which takes a very, very different form. And by the way, I, I was going to mention this. You you mentioned we can have meaningful interactions with, with Roman Catholics because we're both Western. Um, that is the issue in dealing with Eastern Orthodoxy, and yet Eastern Orthodoxy is coming into the West, and it ends up being this strange mutant form that is still very, very difficult to deal with, but it, it has to be able to communicate with Westerners, and um, uh, that, that's, a, that's a major area these days right now. There's a lot of Reformed guys that are looking toward uh, Antioch, right? looking toward Constantinople. And um, I, think, I think that's happening because of 
postmodern rot in the West. In other yeah. words, the West, by adop- uh, adopting and drifting with subjectivism, relativism, and all of the uh, postmodern nonsense, have we've made ourselves vulnerable to an EO move, right? Because it's mystical, it's, it's experiential, it smells and bells, and there's no sense in arguing about it. Uh, the Jesuits will argue with you. Yes, and they'll do well, and, and they'll do it well. Well, modern Jesuits? No, not modern ones. No, no. The, uh, we're, <laughs> we're we're still we're still stuck on the old Jesuits who are Jesuits. Yeah, yeah, the, the, yeah. yeah. I mean, because Francis is a Jesuit. That that tells you everything you need to know right there. But it it sounds like we are both emphasizing the fact there there is only one gospel that saves. Right. Um, that uh, that a a gospel that has no finished work of Christ can never be a saving gospel in of itself. Correct. Um, but that, uh, from your perspective, and obviously you're looking back on the dead here. Right. So you're, you're judging by, I mean, you didn't walk with, with Chesterton. You didn't talk with Chesterton. You didn't live with, with Chesterton. You can only go based upon what, you, what, what, what we have right. and the judge of all the earth would do right. And we want to, to, to hope for the best of so on and so forth. Right. But what you're saying is God used, much of the wisdom that came through Chesterton's words to minister to me, I see spiritual light there. Right. And so my system has a place for him right. in light of that. Right. My system has the good hope that currently today, Chesterton is a better Calvinist than I am. <laughs> well, and and I would just simply want to emphasize that needs that's that's an absolute necessity, right? Because from my perspective, there are so many today who no longer think that these issues can even be defined, right? Let alone are they definitional, right? And that rot, that epistemological rot, um, has I think led to so much of the problems that we see within modern evangelicalism, the, the, the gospel that challenges nothing and can be challenged by everything. I like, I like interacting with people who wake up in the morning knowing what they believe right. because I can talk to them. We can, we can have a discussion. So um, I've, I find conservative Lutherans to be bracing in that way. Um, I, I'm not a Lutheran at all, but I like the fact that they have defined. They have definitions that they will defend and st- stand by, and you can you can have a discussion with a Missouri Synod Lutheran. You can have a discussion with a conservative Roman Catholic. You can have a discussion with a particular kind of Muslim because they believe in truth. Right. Right. And if they are outside of Christ, then the discussion must be evangelistic. If they are clearly inside Christ, the discussion is simply a fellowship discussion. And then there's this borderline, borderline area where I would place Rome and say, I have to make a decision going in whether this is evangelism or fellowship. Yeah. And for me, I, I just automatically default in light of the, my knowledge of what Rome actually teaches, especially on the Mass, um, to the assumption that it, it needs to be evangelism because the other would require me to believe that what the person's actually telling me isn't what they actually believe. And I, I have the same default assumption. So if I go into a, uh, if I'm invited to a group of, I'm going to have lunch with some Roman Catholic priests or whatever, my assumption going in is gospel centered. I'm going to be. Right. I, I, I'm going to be assuming that I am going to be wanting to be a witness for Christ and the gospel, but I'm happily be open to being shown wrong in one instance or across the board. Um, one a uh, uh, year. This was probably three years ago now. Uh, in prior to the election, uh, the 2016 presidential election, I made a passing reference in a sermon that we ought to have bumper stickers that um, said sackcloth and ashes 2016 um, <laughs> cuz our 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 choice was oh, yeah. Trump or Hillary yeah. and so so I um so I a fellow in our congregation took me up on it and made some bumper stickers that said sackcloth and ashes 2016 so I put one on my truck and I was driving around town with sackcloth and ashes 2016 
And I pulled it in the parking lot of the church office, and another guy in a pickup truck followed me in and said, hey, where did you, um, where do you get those uh, bumper stickers? And I said, uh, oh, there's a guy in my church. And I said, I'm a minister. I made a reference. And, and he said, oh, I know who you are, uh, because he had accosted me on the street some years before. He said, I'm the, I'm the Roman Catholic who said, you're, you're going to hell if you don't worship in Latin, you know. Uh, so, <laughs> so, so he was a uh, pre-Vatican II yeah. down, the, down the line. And it was, oh, I know who you are, um, and I think you're going to hell. But that's a good bumper sticker. Where can I get one? <laughs> <laughs> so I think I think the technical term for for him is a Feniite or maybe even a Sedi vacantist. I'm not sure if he believes yeah. the Pope is actually a Pope. So right. Oh, so you've got some of them up there too. Yeah. I, I I had I had no idea they thrived in cold climates. But yeah. uh, there you go. <laughs> yes. So well, Doug, I hope uh, you felt it was a, a useful discussion in uh, laying out some of what these issues are. Yes. Uh, I, I certainly I certainly did, and. Uh, uh, I, again, we end up uh, actually agreeing that uh, what's absolutely important is the gospel and being very Christ very alone. About that. Yeah, That's right. Christ alone That's is right. sufficient. Not not uh, not grace as necessary, but grace is all su- sufficient. all sufficient. All, all is sufficient. That was what the Reformation is about. That needs to be our message today. I thank you very much for the conversation. Hopefully, it was helpful to everybody. Yes. God bless. Thank you. God bless you. Good job on the sweater. 